Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you for being here today and thank you to uh, Interpol for inviting me to address this pretty important uh, <coughs> practitioners forum. I would like to take this opportunity to focus my presentation on the 10 years of existence of the ICC and mainly on what we have learned in those 10 years. The Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC has evolved a lot during that time period. Having uh, created an office from scratch, it is now investigating in seven different countries, having developed 15 cases against 27 defendants. Three cases have already reached trial stage, and two of them have already finished in 2012, and the court has announced its first conviction in March of this year. Simultaneously, we're looking into opening new situations and, of course, working on new warrants of arrest. But in those 10 years, we've learned a lot on how to investigate in conflict areas without exposing staff, witnesses, um, or our own, uh, or victims to any risks that we cannot manage. The evidence gained quite a lot of experience also in how to deal with traumatized witnesses, witnesses who very often do not understand the concept of law or do not understand the necessity to come to trial and testify in court. But this learning curve over these 10 years with positive and negative experiences has in the end resulted in an operational manual that captures our investigative strategies. But we're constantly improving that manual, basically, and one of our strategic goals is to think about how we can share with partners our standards of international investigations. And I was very pleased to hear that uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Sergio Brammers, has already put together the experience of the other tribunals, so I will be very interested in reading that experience, and I'm certain a lot of that will be of good use, not only to the ICC, but to our community as a whole. However, the single most important thing that we've learned is that the Office of the Prosecutor and the ICC more generally cannot operate on its own, and nor can it achieve justice for victims on its own. For the OTP to be successful, it needs to sit within a network of a real partnership which promotes high quality investigations at the ICC, but also supports the prosecutions and investigations conducted at a domestic level. And let me share you with, with you some of the reasons why I think cooperation is of such importance to all of us. First of all, the OTP is well aware of a well-known lesson, lesson well known to all the investigators, which is the golden hour. It's the actions of the first respondents in that golden hour which can easily shape the success or failure of an investigation. When first responders act proactively and effectively in those first days after an incident, their actions can be of use and benefit to the OTP investigators at a later stage because due to its jurisdiction limitations, due to its protection obligations, and due to cooperation requirements, rarely the OTB will be able to act as a first responder in the crimes within the ICC jurisdiction. The Office therefore needs to cooperate with first responders. It needs to help them to make certain in advance that the first responses are of a high quality, and up to the required legal standards to be admissible as, as evidence in court, and that we share the information that is being gathered in an effective way. I personally believe that more can be done in this field of interaction between first responders and the ICC. Just like in any international investigation, after the flurry of initial activities, it's important to sit down and to take stock and work out who went to the crime scene, who spoke to witnesses, who gathered financial data, who had access to telephone information, who had access to email data, etc. If we're not able to come together and share that information, we will end up in a situation where one of us has a suspect available, one of us has victims available, another one of us will have physical evidence available, but none of us are combining the information that will really lead to a prosecution and a successful uh, trial in court. Secondly, Conflict zones seem quite remote from where one usually operates in a national jurisdiction. However, those conflicts are real, in reality closer than one could imagine. People from those areas, whether it be victims, whether it be witnesses or perpetrators, travel to our countries. And these population movements are a huge investigative opportunity to us as an investigative community and 
they are untainted by the witness security issues which normally arise when you try to interview witnesses in conflict areas. For example, using the example of Côte d'Ivoire, which is a situation under investigation before the ICC, asylum seekers from Côte d'Ivoire have increased from 1,500 in 2010 to 5,400 in 2011. Taking another example, taking the example of Libya, there were almost 2,900 asylum seekers in the 27 EU countries. This is an enormous wealth of information and we have to figure out how we can make better use of such a resource. Thirdly, why is cooperation important? Well, ICC suspects act to obtain and or sustain the control of financially lucrative resources or positions of authority. For that purpose, they need to maintain their support networks and at the same time fund their ongoing conflicts. And in doing so, they engage themselves in a wide spectrum of international criminality to which my colleague Sergio also made reference. To fund themselves, they embezzle public funds and or conduct a variety of very lucrative criminal activities. Arms dealing, drugs trafficking, human trafficking, smuggling of minerals and uh, precious metals. They also operate in politically unstable areas with a poor infrastructure and a low socio-economic development which obliges them to move their financial resources to external financial markets and in particular offshore jurisdictions which provide them safe haven from where their assets will be managed. And finally they need to obtain the necessary means, arms, soldiers, high technology equipment and in, or in order to acquire this they need connections with other perpetrators, with criminal and terrorist organizations and networks, both at the national and international level. Finally, cooperation is important because conflict situations and areas of themselves create a marketplace for a range of other criminals. Drug and human traffickers feed off corruption and route their products through failed states. Terrorists recruit in refugee camps and take funds through illicit resource trading in diamonds and gold. Criminals obtain training and weapons in failed states. Armed traffickers breach sanctions to access high-end, top-end prices. There is, as you can see, a clear connection between organized crime and ICC crimes. And in order to fight organized crime at your front door, you need to look into its links to conflict areas and repressive regimes. All those reasons I've mentioned, I think, are reasons why we should really seriously consider how we can improve cooperation. So to conclude, our past, our present and our future as practitioners in the area of crime is cooperation. And we need to ask ourselves the following questions. Do we have a platform to share information about crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide? Do we have a platform that identifies synergies in our investigations? How do I know what I should share with you and what you might have for me. Are we making the best use of each other's experience and expertise? And do we have a common set of standards which will allow us and facilitate the interaction between us much more? But thinking about cooperation, we also need to think less conservatively. We should not restrict our concept of, of cooperation only to ourselves, but also think about interaction with other partners, with NGOs and the media, because they are also first responders with technology companies so that we can access new technologies to strengthen our investigations and increase our access to victims and witnesses. Let me finish my introductory remarks by stating that I hope that this conference is a decisive step to boost our cooperation relations between the ICC, between Interpol, national authorities and other partners. I thank once again the organization and Interpol in particular for their kind invitation. Thank you.